happy Father's Day to all of the men. I'm so excited to be coming to you this morning to share the word of God as we talk about facing your giants. So as we celebrate this Father's Day, even if you've never been a father or your children are good and grown, you are still a father figure to many. Thank you for your service. This is a day we usually praise and give thanks to the men, and I'm sure the presentations following this sermon will do just that. But I want to be a realist too and recognize this day may be full of pain for some. There are men for whom fatherhood was not a celebratory experience, then there are some children, young or old, who feel that their fathers should not be celebrated. But I'm hoping that in this life, that we can move beyond that and listen to what God has to say to us. So we start out by asking, what is Father's Day? We often hear that out of the mouths of babes or kids say the darnest thing. When this little, when his little sister asked the older brother, what is Father's Day? The boy said, Father's Day is just like Mother's Day, although you don't spend as much on the gift. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear a little chuckle there because with Zoom, it's kind of hard to see if you got my joke. But yes, I think you understand where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. Think back for a minute on the things that your father said to you, or more importantly, maybe things that you said to your children. And although I'm talking about fathers, mothers, I think some of these will apply to you as well. Someone wrote these humorous, wrote a humorous word or book called the world according to dad. These are words that most dads, including you perhaps, have said at least one time another to their children or heard it from their fathers. Such things at, I'm not made out of money. Or, especially for those of you who come from another country might say, when I was your age, I walked five miles to and from school every day and it was uphill both ways. Yeah. Or you might say, who's paying the bills around here anyway? Or, I don't care if everyone's doing it, you're not going to. Mm -hmm. Or dad, do you ever say, you better get that junk picked up before your mother comes home? But on a lighter note, how often have you said, I'm not asleep, I was just resting my eyes. Well, today's sermon title, Facing the Challenges. We all have had challenges or are facing challenges now, but you can rest assured that if you're not facing them now, there will be challenges in your next life as well. Challenges can be big or small, and they can be everywhere in your life, at work, at school, at home, and yes, even at church. I asked the Bible study group the other day, what was their biggest challenge? And the answers vary, but praise be to God, they were able to overcome them. This morning, I want to focus on the challenge of parenthood, and my intent is to address fathers, so father. For those of you who became fathers at the birth of your child, meaning you're not a stepfather or an adoptive father, but if you were at the birth of your child, I bet you never imagined that that little bundle of joy would give you sleepless nights at the age of one month, 17 years, 25 years, 40 years, perhaps even counting. You may, not have, you may not have known at the birth of your first child, but if you had more children, maybe you thought it would get better this next time around. Well, how did that work for you? 
with the other children where they're less sleepless nights or just sleepless nights over other things. Raising a family today has plenty of challenges, doesn't it? Families today are busier than ever with multiple activities and events, from sports to music to dance, while eating meals on the run and finding ways to squeeze in time for homework. And certainly the pandemic only intensified the, those activities. Sometimes we as adults leading families and coordinating their never ending schedules, we wonder if all the sacrifices and lugging around and transporting them from here to there will really make any difference. Will it pay off in the end? Is the investment worth the extra effort? And I would like to believe that the answer is yes. If you are a grandparent or a significant adult in a, in a young person's life, you are well aware that your job is not finished yet. For some of you, your families moved out and started families of their own, but that created a whole new dynamic and may involve you once again needing your assistance. Or today, one of the challenges for our challenges for our young adults graduating from high school and college is finding a good paying job. Sometimes the emptiness gets refilled because we need to help our young people for a season of time to achieve a level of success. And the best way to do that is to give them a roof over their heads. And hopefully you've been a good example because then in the later stages of life, sometimes these roles are reversed and the son or, or daughter becomes a parent to their parents and their delicate issues that need handling and helping parents to live independently as possible with dignity or addressing some needs or situations such as Alzheimer's. Whatever stage your family might be in right now, God places us and uses us for a season of time to work with our families, to honor and guide them the best we can. Families, no matter how they are put together, are important. Looking at our text today, the main character in both of our scriptures this morning is David. Let's talk a few minutes about David's physical appearance. Scripture tells us, and we heard it just now, that he was ruddy, he had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. It also describes him as, uh, as playing the lyre, a man of valor, a warrior, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence. But what about Goliath? Scripture tells us that he was a giant. How big is that? We can read that he was nine feet, nine inches, nine feet, nine inches tall. In addition to that, the armor that he wore, that he was wearing, included something called a coat of mail. And you heard about that in scripture. Well, folks, that wasn't letters with stamps. This armor that covered his upper body weighed approximately 150 pounds, 150 pounds. To give you a better sense of that weight, the bulletproof vests that are worn today by our policemen weigh only five to 20 pounds. And if you've watched cop shows, you see that sometimes that seems heavy for them to put on. And the iron tip of his spear weighed anywhere from 12 to 26 pounds, and he wore pieces of armor protecting his shins and around his neck. And yet, David, despite the physical differences between the two, was able to kill the giant without ever having to lay a hand on him. Keeping that in mind, the image of the boy David facing the giant is much more or has much more significance for the Israelite literature or scripture than simply providing a hero tale concerning the first king of the United Monarchy. David's battle with Goliath is a metaphor for Israel's relationship with the world. Surrounded by giants on all sides, tiny Israel had the least sophistication in military arms. 
They had no natural borders or defenses. They had no long imperial history like the Egyptians or the Mesopotamians. As a people, they were a nation of shepherds surrounded by armed giants. The message of the entire Old Testament in many ways can be boiled down to this one image. Israel is of no consequence whatsoever from the fact that their God is the one true God in the universe and that God's power is greater than all the weaknesses that were around them. Those who are believed in this one God were blessed with the right to call upon him. It is precisely that David is weak and flawed and in this sense and in this scene defenseless that God's great miracle of salvation shines all the brighter. So this tells us that David was a good warrior. But I want us to look at David as a father because this is Father's Day. I don't know how much of a biblical scholar you are or even if you're a Bible reader. But I want to and need to remind you of a few things about David as a father. First, David as a husband. It is said that he had eight wives. However, only seven are believed by most biblical scholars. And gentlemen, most of you have trouble handling one wife. But as was the tradition then, David also had concubines. And it's thought that he had probably about 10 of those. The most well-known of his wives were Michal, who was Saul's daughter, Abigail, who was a prophetess, and then, of course, Bathsheba. And let me remind you of the story of David and Bathsheba. David hooked up with Bathsheba, or as it's usually said in scripture, David knew Bathsheba. In the version of the Bible we read, it says that he lay with her and she became pregnant before the death of her husband, Uriah. When the first plan to trick Uriah didn't work, David arranged for him to be killed in battle. But then there's David's children. It is thought that he had about 20 children. In 1 Chronicles chapter 3, there is a list of all of David's descendants for 30 generations. So if you're interested, you can go check that out. The four children you probably know most about would his, be his sons Amnon, Absalom, Solomon, and a daughter Tamar. First, but not in order, Solomon we remember because he becomes king, rebuilds the temple, and writes the book in the Bible, the Songs of Solomon. Well, David's first son, Am Amnon, rapes his half-sister, Tamar. And David's third son, Absalom, who also had the same mother as Tamar, takes matters into his own hands and cunningly has his brother killed for raping his sister. Let's see what Daddy David does that causes some major problems for his family. When King David hears of what Amnon did, David becomes angry and rightly so. But it stops right there. He does nothing more or barely does anything more. He doesn't try to correct the situation. He ignores his daughter's rape. Tamar is confused. What, what's going on here? Absalom, her brother, is thinking this is not right. And we are not given any explanation why David does not correct the situation. We could guess that David sees himself in the situation, just like he took advantage of Bathsheba. Amnon took advantage of Tamar. The first son is perhaps recreating the father's sins. But despite what happened, Absalom is only estranged from the royal family. Even though he is still, still next, not next in succession to the throne, he still sees himself as the heir apparent and takes steps to become the next king prior to David's death. While away from David, Absalom plans an insurrection. And we know that word from what happened on January 6th in this country. 
But David plans a revolt. Unfortunately for Absalom, David finds out about the rebellion and takes steps to bring it down. The king still had hopes of reconciliation with Absalom and instructed the soldiers to be sure Absalom stayed safe. He gave a specific order, beware that none touch the young man, Absalom. But in his haste to get away from David's soldiers, Absalom is slowed down by a collision with a tree. A, a soldier, Joab, had a score to settle with Absalom, so he disobeyed the king, and he, when he found him alive at the tree, he killed him with three darts. When David finds out about the death, but not the manner of death, he says, of course, one of the most well-known lines from the books of Samuel. David cries out, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. I don't mean to imply this afternoon that all that happened to David's children was what was because of David. But I do want to say that David may not have met the challenge of parenthood, of raising children. His job, as with all fathers, was to provide, to protect, and to profess. For those of you who listen to uh, Steve Harvey on the radio or read his books, know that these are the three things he says men are supposed to do, usually in the context of a male-female relationship. But I think it also applies to the men's roles with children. And let me show you how. First, provide. Certainly as king, David provided material things. The children lived in his king-type housing, and he provided food and opportunities. But he did not provide for their spiritual well-being. Today, a father might say, I gave them a color TV, but provided no Bible. I handed them keys to the car, but did not give them the keys to the kingdom of God. I taught them how to make a living but I failed to bring them to Christ who alone can make a life. Yes, fathers are supposed to protect. As commander in chief, David provided an army to protect his family. But did he protect Tamar? Absalom was seen as the heir apparent and so he would have had soldiers to ensure his safety. Remember what I said about David? how he didn't want Absalom to die despite the revolution. And even after Absalom raised, even after Absalom raised an army against David, he still hoped that they would reconcile. As a dad, you do all kinds of things to protect your children. You try to live in neighborhoods that are safe, maybe have burglar alarms in the house, you try not only to be careful about the people they associate with, but with today's technology, you can keep track of who they interact with on the computer. You can even keep track of their physical location through their phones. If they play sports, you make sure that they have all of the correct protective gear. When they learn to ride a bike, and the law makes you do this, you make sure they have on a helmet and padding to protect their knees and elbows. But do you tell them about the protection of the whole armor of God? We hear in Ephesians 6, verses 11 to 18, put on the whole armor of God so that you will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against the enemies of blood and flesh, but against rulers, against the authority, against the cosmic powers of the present darkness. This against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. 
as shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of this, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so, despite the 150 pounds that the giant had, David had the armor of salvation. But did Absalom know that? Do your children know that, Dad? And of course, you are to profess. Profess means to say, to show. Professing your love is more than just words and gifts. Yes, the things I mentioned used to protect them it expresses your love as well. But one of the greatest ways to profess your love is by the giving of your time to be with them. Those of us who attended our, our adult or couple uh, session earlier, you know that that indeed comes from the language of love. But even when you talk about spending time, you must be careful. Here is a sad confession of one father. I took my children to school, but not to church. I taught them to drink, but not of the living water. I rolled them in little league, but not Sunday school. I showed them how to fish, but not to be a fisher of men. I made the Lord's day a holiday, rather than a holy day. I taught them the church was full of hypocrites and made the greater hypocrite of them and me. As parents, we love to quote Ephesians chapter six, verses one through three, which reads, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with the promise so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. But as adults, we kind of forget the next verse. In the contemporary English version, it says, parents, don't be hard on your children, raise them properly, teach them and instruct them about the Lord. The Living Bible says, don't keep on scolding and nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. Rather, bring them up with the loving discipline the Lord himself approves. Children, learn more. Children learn more from our action than from our words. As Absalom learned how David became the king of his battle with Goliath. The scripture text today didn't cover some of the cunning things that David did okay. before and after the battle with the giant. Like before battling the giant, he disobeyed his father to pursue getting to fight the giant or arguing his brothers who thought he was in it for the money. Or after, did he tell Absalom that he took and kept the giant's head in Jerusalem to stake out the city where he would establish his seat of power? So maybe he didn't tell Absalom, but Absalom, I'm sure, found out and wanted to imitate his father. But Absalom didn't live long enough to follow David's example of giving thanks to God. In the NRSV reading of the title this morning, scripture says, Thanksgiving for deliverance from many troubles. This Psalm follows the literary structure of Psalms of Thanksgiving, such as Psalm 16, which we heard earlier. It gives a call to thanks including a reason for worship. It reports the crisis. It tells of deliverance and concludes with a statement of God's faithfulness. David in this song uses storms to speak of the chaos of life. He tells that only the sovereign covenant God, Yahweh, can still the storm and bring them home. This is something we need to teach our children. Remembering God's goodness is not just a good idea or a mere suggestion. It is a command. David says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Believers speak up. We can show our children how to profess their love for God by showing them how God works in our lives 
and encourage them to build their own faith. Have you been ever been overwhelmed with fatherhood and other things? Have you had an experience when life seemed so complicated you didn't know where to start? Life certainly has its obstacles and some of them are so huge we feel helpless. And there are times when we simply do not feel up to the task. The story of David versus Goliath provides a model for us when it comes to facing giants in our lives. First, David used a single shot and one small stone to slay the giant. He used a simple crude weapon to bring down the heavily armored giant. One shot to the forehead was all he needed. We never know when the smallest of the skills that we have will save another person's life, perhaps just a word. We don't have to be Superman or superwomen to come to the aid of others to make a difference in life. We need only to use the skills we have acquired along the way. Men, God's got your back. David explains his background. David is not as tough as the bear nor as strong as the lion, but David knew that he had no business defeating these animals one on one. But he did know this as he declared in verse 37, that God saved him. I don't know what your intimidating giant is today. It may relate to your child or your children, your job or your school. Maybe it's a person or a lawsuit, unemployment, the pandemic, a disaster. Perhaps it is some fear that is lurking around the corner, sucking your energy and draining your faith. Perhaps you don't even know what lies around the corner. Maybe you can't get a handle on what that giant is, but it's there, taunting you. That certainly alone is a giant. David trusted in God to face the giant Goliath. We too can overcome the giants in our lives by trusting that God will give us the strength and courage we need to move forward. All the giants in life can be overcome when we take small steps like prayer and Bible study. Perhaps those seem small, but is something that we know that is powerful. We all have our giants to face. Your Goliath doesn't carry a sword or a spear. He banishes blades of unemployment, abandonment, abuse of depression, drunkenness, children who don't know what to do or who don't want to do the right thing. The giant doesn't parade up and down the hills of Ia, Ia, but he prances through your office, through your bedroom, through your kitchen. It may be the voice of your child saying, Dad, I don't want to do this anymore. Nobody likes me. Maybe it's a cry that your child is giving you right now and you don't know what to do. Maybe it's bad reports or the late night call where you hear someone saying, this is the police department. Do you have a son? Take a page of David's playbook. What made David a man after God's heart, David's confrontation with Goliath demonstrates David's committed, confident and courageous heart. Commit your heart to God. Have confidence in God's ability to handle any situation and then rush your giant with a courageous heart. When you do, you'll not only overcome your obstacles, but you'll become a man or a woman after God's own heart. Dads, rather than focusing on your failures, remember God's faithfulness. Keep a record of God's accomplishments in your life. Catalog your answer prayer. And whenever you face another giant, Go back to that list and let it fill your heart with confidence. That's what David did. And he had a confident and courageous heart. Whatever stage your family might be in right now, whether you're a parent, a grandfather, an aunt, an uncle, or someone who works with you, God places us and uses us for a season of time to work with our young people, to honor and to guide them as best we can. No matter how young or how old you may be, let us never give up on this sacred responsibility that God has entrusted to us. 
Happy Father's Day, Dad. And may God continue to bless you as you face your challenges. Let us pray. Oh God, our Father, when we cry out to you in distress, you bring us through desperate circumstances. You can quiet the storm to a whisper. In a hush, the sea waves, so great is your power. Help us to trust you then, whatever we may face, knowing that you will lead us to the harbor we have been hoping for. We offer you our thanks and our praise. Amen and amen. Amen.